DD Group, Mr Farage. Thank you. Two-thirds of the British people think the European Commission are trying to bully us in these negotiations. And, of course, they're right. The EU's bullying us. It bullies member states. It bullies its next-door neighbours. It even bullies the third world with its neo-colonial policies. Well, of course it does, because the Europe of the Junkers, the Barniers, the Selmars, is power without accountability. Well, at long last, you've met your match in Donald Trump. Now, you may well scream and shout about his aluminium and steel tariffs, but the EU puts tariffs on 13,000 goods coming into it, meaning that shoes and bras and food are more expensive for simple, ordinary folk uh, who don't understand this, because it's never been properly explained to them. And the sheer hypocrisy of criticising Trump, when you already have put tariffs on steel and aluminium, amazes me. But it does show the folly of us going for a transition period. It shows the utter stupidity of the Labour Party wanting to sign us up to this permanently. Because in this USA dispute, we now find ourselves trapped, impotent, unable to act. We need to be free. We voted Brexit. We voted to make our own trade policy, our own trade decisions. We could do a deal with America in 48 hours. We need to act. Yes, well, just yesterday, just yesterday, the Trump administration were describing us as their best ally in the world. Mrs May, we did not vote for a transition period. We voted to leave this organisation. We voted to leave the customs union. We voted to leave the single market. So please, Mrs May, at this summit next week, do what Trump has done. Stand strong against the European Commission, against the unelected bullies, and bearing in mind the Italian elections, weren't they wonderful folks? Yeah, yeah. It's pretty obvious the game is up anyway, so she'll be doing not just the British people a favour, but the whole of Europe too. Hooray. No doubt that the events in the USA over the last few weeks have been a very profound shock to you. Perhaps you're right. You see, what has happened here is somebody has stood on a manifesto for election, got into office, and within one week said that he will hold faith with his own electorate. It is called genuine democracy. Unlike the system we have in the European Union, where the unelected commissioners, like Morgherini here, have the sole right to propose legislation. So I'm sure that it's a great shock to you to see that a genuinely elected Democrat is doing what he was put in to do. Um, and it must be, it must be, um, I would think today in Washington. Sorry. I can't hear you, mate. Di questo Parlamento e delle funzioni istituzionali this Parliament has uh, institutional functions, as does the Commission, commission out of institutional respect to the Commission, but also della, della as a result of, of the Commission's presence. Right. Uh, we need to be right. So, uh, thank you. And out of institutional respect, President, to the truth, perhaps you will understand and agree with me that within the European form of lawmaking, it is the unelected Commission that have the sole right to propose legislation. If I'm wrong in saying that, you can throw me out of this parliament right here, right now, this afternoon. Onorevole Farage, io la richiamo soltanto a un atteggiamento rispettoso. I am just asking Grazie. you to be a little bit more respectful, please. Prego, Thank può you. continuare. You, you may continue. Oh, I'll be respectful, all right. And perhaps you will be too, for the right of the leader of a political party that won the European elections in the United Kingdom in 2014. Now, it seems to me that actually, with all the anti-Trump rhetoric that is coming from everywhere, actually what we're hearing is the true nature of the European project, which is genuine anti-Americanism. Trump is motivated by protecting the United States of America from Islamic terrorism, whereas what has happened in this room and in governments around Europe is you have welcomed these people into your own homes. But can we please, just for a moment, look at the facts? Amongst all the hyperbole and the hysteria, all that Donald Trump has done 
is taken seven countries that were identified by President Obama as posing a risk to the USA. Obama already had put in place extreme vetting. What Trump has done is for 90 days to say, let's examine that vetting and see whether it's good enough. But I want to ask you, Mr. Verhofstadt, and all the others, with your faux outrage today, where were you when Obama in 2011 banned any Iraqi from going into the country for six months? Why do I hear no criticism in this chamber or from the Commission of Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain and others who refuse to take a single, not one, refugee or displaced person from Syria? And how can it be? How can it be that on Holocaust Day, last Friday, not a single one of you criticised the 16 countries in the world that ban Israeli Jews from even going to their country on holiday? What is this hypocrisy? So perhaps what we need to do, Mr. President, and through you to the members, perhaps what we need to do is to be a little bit more constructive. All of us here say we're Democrats. Well, here's a chance to prove it. Let us invite President Trump to come here to this European Parliament. I'm sure as Democrats you'd all agree that what we need to do is to have an open dialogue with the newly elected most powerful man in the world. And if you throw that rejection back in my face, then you prove yourself to be the anti-democratic zealots that I always thought you were. We're joined now from our London newsroom by the former UKIP leader, Nigel Farage. Uh, good morning, Nigel Farage. Good Thanks morning. very much for joining us. Um, how do you think Donald Trump's first year as president of the United States has gone so far? Well, it's been unconventional. It's been controversial on an almost daily basis, but highly effective. And America is now going through a boom. Not just the tax cuts that you mentioned in your package, also deregulation on a very large scale. And now what you're seeing are big American companies, Apple this week, for example, reinvesting tens of billions into the US economy. And I was in Washington DC the week before Christmas and you kind of talk to taxi drivers and bartenders and there's a feeling of real optimism in America. Ultimately, uh, you know, whether it's prime ministers here or presidents in America, it is on the economic circumstances of a country that people are judged and he's doing very well. You said you were um, talking to taxi drivers about um, their opinion. Have you managed to talk to Donald Trump um, in, the, in recent times? Because at one point you were touting yourself as perhaps a go-between between the British government and Donald Trump in, a, in an effort to show yourself perhaps as someone who could bridge the relationship. Yeah, I mean, the one regret really a year on is that uh, the president has been to France on Bastille Day and he's been to Brussels, he's been to Italy, to Poland. He's done big events all over the world. And yet the one country that he himself feels the closest to, don't forget his mother was Scottish, uh, the one country that he, where he values our relationship in terms of security, in terms of defence, where he was very optimistic about putting together a trade deal. Uh, and I would say, frankly, we're now more or less at a standoff between Downing Street and Washington, and I think that's to be regretted. Have you spoken to him recently? Not for a little bit, no, but the last time I did, uh, the one thing that struck me really very squarely was his absolute determination to carry out the things upon which he was elected. You know, when Trump puts a manifesto before the American people, he doesn't do it for short-term tactical advantage, he does it because he intends to carry it out. And that's one of the things that I really do admire about him. Uh, what do you make of opinion polls? Because when you look at the opinion polls uh, relating to Donald Trump, um, his average approval rating, so to speak, in the United States is 39%, the lowest recorded of any elected president yeah. in the first term. Um, he's officially one of the most unpopular presidents in the modern era um, after 12 months in office. This is according to Gallup. These, these are those figures. How does that tally with what you're saying in terms of, well, he's delivered what he well, said in the manifesto and the economy's doing better? Because these polls basically are asking you, do you like the president? You know, George Bush Sr. had an approval rating after the first Gulf War, over 80 percent, and yet he lost the next election. And here's the point. You don't have to like your leaders. You have to respect their, your leaders and think they'll do a good job. And, and I would wager that with growth 
over 3% in America and set to rise this year. But come 2020, if he wants to run again for president, he'll win. Um, the book uh, that's just been released on him, Fire and Fury, yeah. um, I wonder how, that, how, I don't know if you've read, read the book, I've seen excerpts from the book, but one of um, the descriptions of President Trump from White House staff is childlike. I mean, this has done not much for his reputation in terms of the image he's, he's um, portraying. Yeah. Look, he is not a conventional political figure. He is a self-made real estate billionaire from New York, a city in which they kind of say things uh, the way they see them. Uh, all through my life, I've met people in business, in politics, big, wealthy entrepreneurs, and every single one of them is idiosyncratic. And yeah, sure, you know, the president gets upset with things. The president gets angry with things. He's not like anybody else that's ever been inside that White House. But you know what? It doesn't matter. Because one of the reasons that he won is people don't want career politicians like Hillary Clinton. They want someone different. They want someone straight. And as I say, provided he keeps on doing the right job, for the US economy, he will go down as a very successful president. Well, you say he's different, but you know, you look at a campaign and you see what politicians promise, and that's, that's what most people base their voting decisions upon. He promised a wall. This was one of his campaign promises. He hasn't delivered on that, has he? You know, if you he is compare, like the other politicians in terms like that. He hasn't delivered. If you compare what he's done in his first year to what the last four or five British governments have done, they promise things in their manifestos that they've even got no intention of carrying out. He has done some remarkable things. Tax reform, deregulation, these were all things that were promised in the manifesto. A massive crackdown on illegal immigration coming into America. Uh, and yes, he promised a wall. He's only 25% of the way through his term. I'm convinced there will be a wall. OK, let's move from a wall to a bridge. Apparently Boris Johnson um, thinks that we need to um, have more co of a connection with the continent, with, um, the, the, um, in the, with the EU, especially since we, as we, Brexit is on the cards. Um, what do you make of that? Boris Johnson saying we need more than just the Channel Tunnel. Well, Boris Johnson likes the big Grand Projet, doesn't he? I mean, the previous thing he wanted was a big airport out in the Thames estuary. Uh, now it's a bridge across the English Channel. All I can say is, given the size of the modern container vessels that come through the channel from China, it will have to be a very high bridge indeed, which means on many days of the year,